So uh, welcome. Um, I'm here to uh, give a talk about uh, marking in C++. So before I go into how to do marking in C++, the first question is why do we even want to do marking at all? And why do we want to do testing at all? Which brings me back to the first question. We are making software. And the, th the recipe that we're following is to make something work. And when it works, we make it reliable, as in it works in all circumstances. And when we've done that, we make it fast. But the principle is that, number one, it has to work. Otherwise, there's no point. And making something work and testing it by yourself, well, it's not even that hard. You can test it manually. You can rerun a few test cases. You can assume that things will work. Some people do that. But there are different reasons why you do want to have automatic tests, which is you're not the only person working on the software. So as much as your software works now and you can test it, somebody else will change it. And there's usually more than 10 people, it's like hundreds. And they will break it much faster than you can fix it. So there's a rule about that. And it's, I think, a, a pretty universally accepted rule now, which is if you liked it, then you should put a test on it. So in software, anything that you've tested will work, and anything that you did not explicitly test does not necessarily work. It doesn't mean it's broken, but it doesn't mean it works. So only the features that you're testing work, and everything else, it could work, but it probably doesn't. So at, at this point, we're only focusing on the functional side of things, so not performance yet. And this only works if your tests are fast and reliable because I'm giving my tests to somebody else, and he's going to run them together with 199 other people's tests, and he's going to expect to work on his own subject and finish while well, testing within five minutes, which means that my time slice is about one and a half seconds, if I'm lucky. And somebody else will be slow, so you better be faster than that. And they have to be reliable, because out of those 200, if one of them on average fails, which is less than half a percent, then you don't have any useful test results. So you have to be really, really reliable. So how do you get reliability in a test? Well, you test in different layers. You start by having small tests for small components. That makes them fast. You test in integrated subsystems, which means that the assumptions you made at the bottom level, you stop aspecting them out and you test the whole, which will be slower, but it will test more. And in the end, you should never forget to test in a production-like environment because it's always going to be different from your test environment unless you're a person who said that they actually just take the test environment and copy that to production because that's more reliable. This is a better idea. And you separate your test types. You first of all test functionally. You want to test what's it supposed to do. And if you have a failure case, that's also something it's supposed to handle reliably. So that's also a functional test you should be doing. And performance, reliability, security, that's all stuff you can test later. So the thing you're doing is trying to decouple, as in I have my complicated bit of software, it goes to a bank, it uh, buys a book, it interacts with the Barnes & Noble website. And those things shouldn't be the responsibility of one block of code. So you have separated out responsibilities. And those things um, make it easier to test. And one of the things that many people forget is, for example, concurrency. If I'm doing multi-threading, then I'm inherently unpredictable. So the multi-threading is something that I should try to separate out from my code. That means my code is testable, but it also means that there's an ex uh, extra bit of separation. So the technique to do that usually is to mark out a dependency. So just to have a basic example, so we know what kind of thing that is. So we have a bank, and I can transfer money from an account to an account with a certain amount of money. I can buy a book, which is given my bank and my account, I can transfer some money to a merchant's account. I've hard-coded it for ease of use. And I can test that I can buy a book. I have a mark bank, because I'm not, not spending money on my own account. And I expect a call on the bank to transfer from my account to the merchant's account the amount of money. I call the function that actually should be doing the work, and I verify that it did that call. So on a basic, simple level, this is what marking is. But then you look at C++, and actually, we can't make that. Because the thing that we had, which is making a mock of a bank, I can't compile them reflect on the class. I don't know what's in it. And assuming that I did, which is a bunch of proposals, I wouldn't be able to use it. 
because I need to instantiate a new function and I can't do that at compile time. I need to do that in the preprocessor when I can still emit more code. But I can't get the information back from the compile time stuff to the preprocessor because there's no way to get there. Which means that this is basically impossible. So what can we get? If I'm looking at it, I have a mock of a class. And it tells me the type of the class. It tells me the size, it tells me the alignment. I could try SVNA to get specific functions out, i.e. try to match them, and if it matches, then I know that there's a function with that name, I could get the arguments. But that's just for specific functions. Which means that there's no way to generically explore anything in the class at all, up to C++03. And there's a guy called Anthony Polukin who found a way to do limited exploration of everything except for functions, as in you can reflect data members, by trying to uh, in place construct it, as in using an aggregate initialization. And that does allow you to sort of figure out what's in there in terms of data members. But in this case, we're interested in everything but the data members. So there is something, but there's nothing of use. <coughs> then we have an expect call. And that gets me the type of the object. It gets me the type of the function. And it gets me the type of the class that contains that function which interestingly may not be either the class that I'm specifying nor the type of the object that I'm calling it on. It could be a third one. It gets me the return value, it gets me the arguments, and it gets me whether the function is a const or a volatile function. So that's a quite a bit of information. But expect call is a macro, so of course we get a file and a line. It's not very useful in terms of mocking, but it's useful in ter terms of telling the user this function was not called and you added an expectation in that file and that line. So it ends up being useful, but it's not in this regard. And if I look at this, there's a member function pointer. And member function pointers contain a lot of information. They tell me which offset from the base it is, as in if I have a multiply inherited object, I need to apply an offset to the base to get to write this pointer to then invoke the function. It tells me whether the function is virtual, as in if I'm invoking it, do I take a vtable and then invoke at some offset? Or do I just take the address and invoke that function? So that's a lot of information. So if you look at the, at the member function pointer, this is basically what it looks like. And this is a GCC and Clang specific slide, as in it's pretty much every normal compiler except for Visual Studio. And it has the uh, function address, the vtable index, and a Boolean, whether it's virtual, stashed into one word and the offset from the base in the other. So that gets a lot of information out. So I can create a mock by making a mock class, just assuming that I can for now. I inherit from the interface that I mock, and I implement all the functions. Everything manual. So that's bad. Because what I'm essentially doing is I'm specifying my interface, then I'm re-specifying my interface with a second kind of syntax just to get a mock. Which means every time I add a function, I add it to all the mocks. If I remove it from a function, uh, from my class, I may forget to remove it from the mock. There could be a bunch of latent bugs. You have a cons and a non-cons function, and actually the class only has one of them, but you have both of them in the mock, and you're accidentally calling the wrong one. C++11 kind of fixed that by having override, which means that if your mocking framework uses that, you will get a compiler, which is great if it uses it. And then I started thinking, well, why am I doing this by hand? There's nothing that the compiler doesn't already know because I'm just repeating myself again. So why am I doing it by hand? I mean, I need a duck. I have a duck interface. It needs to conform to a duck interface and it has to do whatever a duck does. It has to walk like a duck, quack like a duck. But I don't care if it's a duck. All that I care of is that it meets the requirements for a duck. So I could pass in a duck. And this is a duck, according to my specs. It walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. But it actually isn't a duck. It's a mock object. <laughs> which I'm just pretending to be a mock. So why wouldn't that work? So what is an object, actually? As in, what does my mock object have to satisfy at an application binary interface level? So I made a simple class. There's class X has a constructor, it has a virtual destructor, it has a virtual function, because it's prototypical, and it has one data member. It could be more, but it's essentially a linear extension. 
So if I put on my compiler glasses and I'm looking at this, I'm assuming you brought yours. I see I have a virtual. Just there's a virtual, so I need a vtable. There's an int, I need to have an int. And that's all I need in my runtime object. So the runtime object will be a vtable pointer plus an int, which is 8 bytes on 32 bits, 16 bytes on 64 bits. That's not too hard. This is what happens with the virtual functions. I have a destructor, and spoiler, you actually have three destructors, and two of them end up in the, in the vtable. So it has two slots, it's a bit special. I have a function, it gets its own slot. There's two other values in there. And those are the object uh, offset, as in given that I'm invoking a function from this vtable, then I have to apply this offset to my base pointer. And there's an RTTI object pointer, which conveniently enough is the exact same thing that you would get if you do type ID. There's a flat table, it has just a jumble of functions, it's all the functions in there. And you can view that as basically a set of void pointers. There's one entry per function, there's two for a destructor. There's no more complication there. It's actually a really simple struct. And everything is read only and per class. Then I look at the uh, class declaration. <coughs> In this case, I have class X. It has no parent class, it has no inheritance. So that's actually kind of simple. I have an RTTI object, a virtual table because the uh, type info has a vtable that it uses for dynamic cost. There's a name pointer, which is the name that I'm applying, and it has a list of all the base class pointers. And in this case, there's actually none. And that contains the virtual functions to use the type, as in dynamic cost. Uh, uh, type ID, sorry, almost forgot that one. It has the name of the class, and it has all the base pointers. It's also interestingly used for exception handler matching, as in if you're doing an upcasting or exception handler, it also uses this information. And this is again only read-only data. So if I turn on RTTI, I don't get a bigger data set, I just get more, uh, more read-only data, which I could even relocate into some portion of memory that I never load, unless I'm explicitly asking for it. So in a graphical overview, this is the entire thing that I have. I have three objects, so that's three object sized, I have a vtable, I have an RTI object, I have a name. So can I do this by hand? So let's go for the, uh, the manual approach. Let's go make it an assembly. Um, before I do that, um, there is a thing that I need to explain, which is function mangling. Because if I have a destructor, and I have a demangled destructor, it's gonna say this is the destructor of X. And there's actually two of them. So if I just gave you the, the, the demangled names, there would be just two functions with the same name. So we have the mangled names. So speed cores and mangling. We start with an uh, introducer, which is underscore Z, which says this is a C++ identifier. Then we have a named construct, a nested list of names, which is like X columns, Y column Z. That's between an N and an E. And then there's one or more literal names. So one X is a one length literal, which is X. And then we have C1, which stands for the first constructor. And in the end, we have the argument list, which means that this is a constructor that has no arguments. So this is the start of the implementation. We have a constructor. It puts the V table in the object in the right place, and that's all it does. I have a destructor. It does nothing. I have a function. It does nothing. I have a second destructor. And this one calls the other destructor, and then it calls delete. Because when you delete an object, you actually don't call delete. You're just invoking a destructor, and you're invoking the deleting destructor, which is then responsible for calling the other destructor, and then deleting the object. And this is to be able to have an operator uh, delete overload without having a virtual operator delete. So it's hidden in, inside your destructor. And I have a V table. It has a zero because it's the base offset. It has a pointer to type info. It has the two destructors. It has a function. I have my t uh, type info implementation, which has a reference to the standard CXX ABI class type info, which means I have no, ba no base classes. There's also an SI class type info, which is if I do have base classes. And there's a VMI, which is for virtual and multiple inherited base classes and I have a link to my name. And the name just says this is class X. 
So we can do this. So we have the implementation. We can imp implement them, we can call various functions on it. And there is no implementation for X here other than the assembly, uh, the assembly file. And if you look through the globals and exporting information, this is basically the name of the file, uh, the name of the class, the, the uh, type info, the function implementations, which are exactly the stuff that we had, the constructor all the way at the bottom, and the vtable. And if I run this, it does exactly what the program does, which is allocate objects, delete objects, all parts of this you can just implement in assembly and there's no problems whatsoever. Let's see, there it is. So can we do this without assembly, as in just runtime allocate things in C++? So we capture the info we need at compile time, we construct an object, we reinterpret cost to the right type, it's kind of evil, and then we just use it as, as if it implemented the right type. So let's try it. Simple example, we have vtable, it has a function. It's a virtual function, so you can't actually invoke it. And we have an implementation, which is an array of functions, and we just put a function in there. So can we do that? Um, I think it's this one. So we have a class, it has a virtual function. There's no implementation anywhere in sight. So we should never be able to have an implementation of C that we can use. We have a function, it returns 42, because we have a struct which contains an array of functions in a indirect pointer, as in, it's like a V table. And then we construct one with malloc, we construct an object, we construct a, a virtual function table, we insert the function, reinterpret cost to the right type, and call the function. So does that work? <coughs> of course it does. So okay, we can make virtual functions at runtime by just doing evil things. So can we go further? So let's go for the complicated one. We are going to make a runtime constructed string in a, a, a structure that is analogous to what the compiler would have for invoking my function. So this one's a bit more code. I, oh, I think I won't be able to show the entire code because it's a bit much. So this is a test framework, as in we have a struct t, it has a virtual destructor. I have a function, I'm passing in a name, and I get a pointer to it. And the thing I'm doing is I call a function, I get my object, I take the type ID of the object, and I print a name. Which means that the compiler, other than not knowing whether there's a class deriving from t, should basically be able to say this is the name of the class. And this, Let's not read all of it. This is basically do it yourself, hack it together. And then take the name that we pass in, put it into the RTTI object name, and return the object. And that works. So essentially, you can runtime construct any object you want with whatever fields you want. So we can make a mock out of that. Except that we can't. Because I have a V table, but how many functions are in there? Well, I don't know. There's actually no way to find out. It's not even necessarily available at link time. As in your linker doesn't know how big the V table is. It's just part of some section with data and there could be three V tables in there. There's no way to know. But I can guess, I can make it big enough. Let's say a thousand functions. If anybody ever seen a class with more than a thousand functions? So other than Mark, yay, we win. <laughs> but still kind of no, because there's an inheritance graph, there's multiple V tables. Because I might have multiple inheritance, I might have virtual inheritance. It's a giant mess. So how many V tables do I make? Well, I'll just go for the easy one. We'll, we take the entire object and we fill it all the way with V tables. V tables in all the places. That works. But uh, what do we put in the V table? Because I don't know what function is there. And anybody might invoke any virtual function, 
And it would be nice if it just didn't crash, but does something useful. So, um, well, we can put in a function there and it can throw. If I throw, I don't have a return value, so I don't have to worry about constructing that, whether it needs to be constructed, anything. And there's no argument cleanup for me. That's handled by the caller function. So that works. Since C++11, this actually might not always work if you have no accept functions, because I can't throw from a no accept function. In that case, you can hook into a test frame and can say, this function was invoked. I did not expect it. I didn't see it coming. And there's nothing we can do. I can't return from this. And then the test framework can, in some ways, handle that and continue in different ways. But it's still kind of no, because I have an object, there's, there's members in here, there's strings, for example, and I'm not constructing them. So how do I initialize those? Well, I could just not initialize anything, because you're supposed to use interfaces which don't have members. But if you do, you can basically just ask, so if, if you just point me to the thing you want to initialize with the right type, I can construct it there. That's okay. So, sure, we can do this. Just capture the size, create a large enough fee table, put an RTI object, um, hook it into a marking framework, which, which is basically the simple software engineering side of it. And that works. There's a tiny elephant in the room, though, because this is in very, very many, many different ways undefined behavior. As in, you're invoking a function on a runtime construct that ABI level matches. So on ABI level, this is defined behavior. But if your compiler sees any of this and understands it, it's going to be basically ignoring it entirely. It's all undefined. So it means that if you have an optimizer, it will look at it and say, this is impossible, this couldn't happen. At link time, there's no class inheriting from this interface, so you couldn't have a test running against it because it would just crash. Because it doesn't see this one. So right now, there's a, a bit of a caveat. You cannot do it with a release build, and you really shouldn't use LTO, because it will basically optimize everything away and make your test fail. But there are advantages as in advantages that you couldn't have gotten if you went for the normal way. So for example, we have a deleting destructor. I could make the deleting destructor just not delete. As in, just take the assembly, comment it out. There we go, non-deleting deleting destructor. And then call into the marking framework and say, well, this object is now deleted. And that means that if you use a deleted object, any dangling pointer will just give you a message saying, hey, you used the deleted object at this and this location. Here's a stack trace. Let's go to the next unit test. Keep running. So that's a nice one. I can just not construct your base class. If you're having uh, proper interfaces, this does nothing. But if you have uh, regular classes, that means you can just make a mock of the class without changing it. And you're not invoking a constructor, so you don't have any of the side effects that that would have which means that you can test some things with less refactoring than otherwise. But you do have to watch out because you are actually not constructing your base class. So if it has some kind of invariant that is maintaining, it isn't now. So if you have a list of substitution principle, it just might not. I can test the use of an interface and never ever have implemented it. The linker would be disagreeing, as in there's no implementation for this, so it couldn't work. But you can write a test, you can use it. So if you have five interfaces to use, just use them. No marking code to write, no dependencies on other people. You can make a test and then just send them the interface and say, this is what I've tested against. And if you use this, then it will work. So it's much less code to write. And the biggest one, I can hook into a DI framework. And the dependency injection is essentially the uh, classes that you depend on are injected by a dependency injection framework at construction time. And it generates those, it creates those at the moment somebody's asking for it. As in, the moment you're requesting a top-level class, it will instantiate all the dependencies that it needs for that with their dependencies and then give them to you to instantiate. And this means that instead of actually instantiating anything, it could just give marks for everything. So I'm not implementing anything, I just use marks for everything. So I can't forget to mark something because everything is automatically marked. I don't even have an, a barrier to testing because the moment I write my class, dependency injection gets me the marks to be put in. I can use them right away. So easy. So uh, there's a presentation which is, I think, on Friday by Chris Jusiak, which is about Boost DI. 
which also allows you to use HIPAA marks to do that. So this is not a theoretical advantage. But there's a disadvantage. That's the obvious one, this is undefined behavior. There's no way of getting around that. Uh, so there's alternative ways to do this, as in suppose that undefined behavior is terrible, which it is. Uh, what other ways could we do things? So we could just use macros and ask the user to do things, uh, have a whole lot of duplicated code. Well, that works. There's Trompe which is by, written by Bjorn Fowler. There's Google Mark from Google. There's many others that do this because it's the, it's the logical way to do things, essentially. It's a lot more work because you have to make your own mock classes. You have to agree with other people where to put the mock classes. If not, then you're writing a mock class maybe 10 times, and I've seen that. And there's a lot of maintenance issues from that because you are repeating yourself a whole lot. There's a different way you can have your IDE generate it for you. Yes, there's a slide be beyond this one, <laughs> which is you can use an IDE to generate it for you, <laughs> which, does, which is Google Mark that does that. And there are other, uh, others, I think, develop. Yes. So there's, that's better. But essentially, it comes down to you are parsing C++. And that's, on one hand, very hard. And on the other hand, somebody may have included a macro that changes the definition of the class, which is an ODR violation, but p uh, people do it. Which means that, essentially, you're best guessing how to make a mock. So that works, but it's a lot of work. So if the parsing C++ is so hard, why don't we just use a compiler to do that? Just take Clang. Or, um, you know, make objects and then based on the information in the object, just export some dependencies on that. Just mark it at that point. And this, it's essentially a, a very strong vendor lock into that compiler, which nowadays might not be a biggest issue. And it's also an additional build step. So I wouldn't prefer it. But that's also the future. And in the future, everything is going to be perfect. <laughs> but the future is not... C++ 17, sadly, because Reflection didn't even make it into a TS yet, which implies that it will not be in C++ 20. So I went on to go dreaming for C++ 23. I'm not sure about the year, but I have heard other people mention the same year, so that might be nice. So this is based on the idea of what Herb Sutter also presented, which is having a const expert block, for which there is a paper. And I iterate over all the functions that I reflect out of my class. And if it's a virtual function, then I reify a new function with a Lambda implementation. So this would replace all the low-level hackery behind it. And it would be a drop-in replacement, except for a few tiny details, which is that everything that's read doesn't exist. And in fact, const extra blocks, they have been proposed, but people aren't quite agreeing on how they work yet. Uh, reflecting on a class has been proposed, but there's no complete agreement. They don't include functions in the reflection, which means that you don't have the is virtual, you don't even have the f object to, to look at. And there's no way to reify that because that doesn't exist yet. And there have been proposals thinking about doing that, but nothing concrete. Which means that this is, if it's gonna make 23, I'm gonna be very happy. Hey Peter, can I ask, I'm not super, I, mean, I know this is just a totally theoretical, but mm -hmm. the dot dot dot, is that, um, a real token in this example, or is that just you would, what, what would you put in the body of that function? In the body of the function, I would basically do the same forwarding to the marking framework that I'm doing now. Yeah. So, uh, so the dot, dot, dot is not real syntax, but like that's actually, you would put something else in there. So the question is, uh, the dots in the, in the implementation, which is this set of dots, not the ones behind the arguments, yeah. uh, is that the actual implementation, or what would, you put, what would I put there? So I wouldn't have the dots, I would have the actual implementation, which tries to forward all the information that you get, so the arguments you get, and the information about the class that you're invoking it on to the marking framework to then figure out which class, uh, which mark function you're actually invoking and what return value to get. You have some math to the marks that is also determined at compile time. Like you have to look up based on the function meta information. So the question is how I know which function was actually invoked. <coughs> So it knows which function was invoked because at creation time of a mock, it also registers that says this is a mock of that type, etc. And when you're registering an expectation, you also pass in which mock it's on. So it then knows to match that one as one of the arguments. So this is really nice because it's essentially take all the undefined behavior, throw it out the window, replace it with a complete conformant implementation. It works very well with all the optimized because it's all defined. 
And the best one is, if you don't have a mark, then there's only one implementation, which means that your linker will see that and conditionally devirtualize all the function calls, which means you don't even get a virtual function call overhead most of the time. And lucky for me, this is exactly the same interface to the user that I had before. So if this makes it in, I can replace the entire guts of the thing and everything works as it did before. And this is not just for mocking, because I, I was thinking about it as in, is it just something that I would like and it's useless everywhere else, but you can make a proxy out of it. So if you did RPC, you just register a proxy for type X, it reflects on the functions, static asserts that everything is virtual because a proxy wouldn't make sense for anything else, and then you reify a remote call. So this is one implementation that could be used. You could make a logging decorator. I pass in a inner implementation, and given any function call, I log whatever the arguments are, and then I forward to the inner implementation. So that's nice. But this is the future, and most people are not quite in the future yet, as in we're in legacy code bases. And there's something to be done for that as well, because most marketing frameworks basically say you have everything in an interface, and then you can mock the interface and you can use it. That's nice. Um, but that puts me in a, in a conundrum, because my code base doesn't use interfaces yet, which means that I can't make a unit test, because there's no interface. So I have to refactor the code a bit, so I can make a unit test. But if I refactor the code, I'm probably going to break it, and it's going to come out when we have the important meeting with the million dollar client, and everything's going to fall over. So I have to create a unit test first. But back to point one, essentially you, you have no way to win, there's no way to start making tests for that and get somewhere. And it basically boils down to, I don't have interfaces, so I, have, I just use free functions directly. So, just mock those. If I'm calling malloc, just mock malloc in place. So there's a few ways to do that. Uh, there's a mocking framework for C, which allows you to do this. And it's basically just use a macro to replace it at compile time, have a different implementation. That's not 100% stable, because you have a macro. If it didn't replace, and you're just using the actual function, you may not even notice, because the replacement malloc may just actually have run out of memory, or it may just actually work. Uh, there's one build per replacement set, because you are replacing them at compile time, and you can only choose to either replace it or not replace it. And that means that every time you have a different uh, test uh, fixture, you're basically re replicating everything. And there's a lot of ugly macro use. So if you actually do make interfaces after that, you don't get to reuse these tests because you then have to merge them all into one group, et cetera, et cetera. It's a lot of work. <coughs> and you're just redirecting to a function, which uh, brings up the point that Jackie pointed out. You don't even know where it's coming from or what expectation to do. So this is nice because it works in C, but it's also not nice because it's really hard to use. So let's use an evocable object. All the same downsides, and now it's not even C compatible anymore but I do have context, so that's an advantage. So next attempt, let's try to replace it at link time or at load time. So we can either make an, an intentional ODR violation, I just make another malloc, make another function f, and just pray that it uses the right one. That should work, but it may not work depending on your dependency order, and the bigger your project is, the more it will break. Is it really an ODR, because I did something like that once, and I was told that I was uh, violating the ODR, and as far as I know, the ODR means that it's within the same program, you cannot have two completely manipulations or more for the same symbol, right? However, <coughs> when you link your program, let's just stick to uh, static libraries. If you have uh, the object that you put on the ring line followed by references to libraries, uh, and two libraries offer the same symbol, like let's say malloc, uh, is that really a violation of the ODR because the linker is going to typically select uh, the first instance of malloc that it finds and there will still be only one malloc within the same program? So the question is, is this actually an ODR violation? Uh, because your linker may reliably select the right function every time. And it is, but not in all cases. Uh, if you have a, a dynamic function, then you are allowed to make your own implementation. And there are special techniques that I'll get to later on that will make the implementation library, as in libc, then actually use your malloc 
So that is, it smells like an ODR violation, but it isn't. However, if you have different functions inside your own program that you're statically linking against, then the compiler doesn't necessarily know if it's coming from that library or from this library, and it will only start looking for it as soon as it has one link requesting it. So if you have a malloc request only deep inside your code, and it hits the mocking library first, then you're fine. If it hits libc first, then we'll just use one from libc. And that's the, uh, depending on link order, that it may or may not work. And it depends on more details than you actually want in your test environment. So it's, it's a bit fragile. You could also use LD preload path to continue. Uh, that works because it only works for dynamic libraries, but you can replace all the functions that are in there. It's platform specific. And everybody who's working with you is going to say that this is evil because you're replacing things at link time. As in running the program standalone doesn't do the same thing that it does in the test environment. It makes it very hard to run tests separately. It uh, requires a lot more mental baggage to figure out what's going on. But if we're thinking about evil anyway, why not just replace the function itself at runtime? I mean, what's a function? Well, this is a function. It calls some other function that has a few opcodes. Why don't we just overwrite this with the function that we actually want? Or actually, because the function that we actually want, we don't know how big it is. So we just jump there. So I'm just going to rewrite that. So instead of the actual function, I just make it a jump to my mark function. There's a bit of corrupt data behind that, but we don't care. That works up to a point. So let's do it in C++. Let's take the address of malloc, cast it to a byte pointer, and write a few bytes there. Does anybody see a problem with this? You get an access violation. You get an access violation because you're writing to code, which is a terrible idea. And the solution is to just ask nicely. So we go to the operating system and we say, dear operating system, could you please make this malloc pointer like writable for me? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and then everything's fine. <laughs> and it works. <coughs> With a few caveats. Because number one, the replacement code has to fit in the function. If I have a function that just returns, that might just be two bytes. And the smallest jump I can put in there, it's five bytes. So there is a bit of a risk that it might not fit. And the biggest one that I might need to insert, depending on the jump target, is 14 bytes. So there is a chance that you're overriding a different function and causing trouble. The second one is that my malloc is not your malloc, which is coming back to that point, because even your malloc may not be your malloc. If I look at the executable, I have a function called malloc, and it's a local function inside my executable. But I didn't actually have a malloc inside here, so this is a malloc at plt which is the procedure linkage table. And the only thing this does is basically look up the actual malloc using the dynamic, the dynamic linker and then just go to it. So the moment you actually invoke it, it loads libc and that has a malloc. And that also has a malloc at plt, which is that if I have my own malloc and libc is supposed to use that, then we make it like that, as in they both point to my malloc. But now this brings up a question. If I take the address of malloc, where do I even end up? And the answer is sadly that it could be any one of them. So that means that if you have two function pointers and you compare them by value and they're equal, they are the same function. If they're not equal, they still might be the same function, but you don't know. So what we can do is take the address of our local malloc, which is the one in the PLT, and make that point to the mark malloc. And that has actually an advantage instead of a disadvantage because it means that any function in libc that is using malloc, such as stringed up or other functions, they will just work. And you will not get a test violation because some implementation detail of some other function uses something that you marked, which means that this is a viable way of doing things. But the third one is that my f may actually not even be my f. As in, if I have a function and it's inlined, and then I try to uh, mock it, I take the address of the function. That's an ODR use, which means that the function will be emitted separately, but you're not guaranteed that it's not also somewhere else. So if I'm replacing my function f, it might not actually be invoked at all ever because it's inlined all the way. So again, try not to inline things um, and try to have a stable test environment. 
this is uh, actually the reason why uh, HippoMox doesn't allow you to mock non-virtual functions. Because I've had a patch from somebody who showed that it works. You can do that. But it would mock it out for everybody, and it wouldn't work in inline functions. And if there's anything that's inline very often, it's a member function. So it would be very, very unstable if you did. So it's good for testing, but it's not 100%. So use it to start, then refactor your code, then make the test user, the interfaces, and then you're set. So now I get to the more um, controversial part. So number one, how much should you test? As in, if I have more tests, then there's a little chance of breakage because I'm testing all corner cases. But it's also a whole lot of work to do any kind of change. If I have 100 tests testing a 12-line function, and I change the behavior because in some cases you actually want to change the thing it does, then there's 40 tests breaking. This means that your work to change one small function is now changing one small function and 40 test cases. And then explaining all that to your coworkers who think that modifying a test case means you did something bad. So you should actually be testing less, as weird as it sounds. But you do have, have to test enough so that all the major cases that you want to have working actually work. But it means that corner cases could break. There's no way to fix that other than testing more and making it more resistant to, to change. But that does mean your code is at least modifiable, as in you can make it do things. And a way to think about that is if you have code, code costs about a, a certain amount of money to keep in existence. And that amount of money goes into the code might break on a compiler, uh, somebody else is new who has to read it to understand it. Um, there's many different ways in which having code alone is a cost. So having test code is also a cost. And the more code and the more complicated code you have, the bigger the cost is. So essentially having less code in any form, even including test code, is a good thing. Um, there's also one that is about when should you use mocks. Because um, a weird thing that I found out is I wrote the mocking library, and then I used it a fair bit, and I've started to use it less and less. Because the more things that I do, I tend to write more small components that are just unit testable by themselves. They don't have dependencies. And the big components that I have that have dependencies don't do anything. They just string up a few small components. So testing those is basically, if you would use a mocking framework, then register three expectations and then call a function that says I'm calling A, B, and C. Which means that there's no value in there, there's no actual logic being tested. So in that case, you might as well just not test that. Which means that the most of the test cases that I tend to write don't use mocking at all. If you're in a situation that you want to have high test coverage or you do want to make something resilient to change, then you will probably end up using a lot of mocks. And the last one is that in uh, one case, I actually had to decide to use the throwing destructor. Because if you look at the function that I had in the beginning, it starts by having a test uh, context, which is the mock uh, repository. Then you have a bunch of test content, and you have a verify all function. And the verify all function checks that all the functions that should have been called actually were called. But that means that if you forget to call that, there's no way to notice. But I will notice in my destructor that actually you forgot to call a function <laughs> and the entire test is passed, there's nothing going on, and I have an error to report. So I should report that if nothing else is already going on. So I'm not sure what you guys think about that. Because this is basically against the common wisdom of never having a throwing destructor. Except in this case, it is the correct way to handle it. I do actually want to know your opinion about that. Okay. So the problems occur when that throwing destructor is called during stack unwinding. So if you can guarantee that that never happens, then you're good. So the comment from Stephen, right? Yes. Is that the, uh, the problem with the throwing destructor is that if you're ever called during stack unwinding, which this one will be, and you're throwing, then that is going to cause a standard terminate and everything will fall over. And the rationale behind that is that if there is an error already flowing, then the mock errors are irrelevant. As in, if you have a test and it's already done something bad, and there's an exception going on that says what it is, then who cares that you didn't call a function that you're probably going to call later on? So anything that would be detected at that point is irrelevant. It's only in the case that everything was fine, then we might have an error. 
and then we might have an error that you actually want to report. So uh, my understanding is you install an exception in the mock destructors in order to kind of report errors. Like you're using exception as a callback mechanism, or and also as a way of executing control flow from errors and counters. Is that correct? Uh, so the question is that I'm using exceptions to uh, exit control flow and to report errors. And if I'm correct in that, yes, that's the way to do it. To do it. So basically, if you're invoking a function and either no uh, registered function call matches or there was no function call, remember the uh, initial contents of the v-table, then the only thing I can do is throw an error and say, well, I don't know what's going on here, and we should terminate the test case now. An alternative would be co to call in actively into a test framework to say, something bad has happened and we need to abort, and then leave it up to the test framework to figure out how to do that, which means that you could use this without throwing anything, but that would be basically rerouting re all the uh, exception handling to some other pathway of handling errors. But in the end, what you want is basically the stack to be unwound back to the test framework to say, well, something bad happened in this test case, let's exit and let's go back to, back to what we had originally. Let's go to the next test case. So I'm afraid I'm underrunning the time a bit because this is the end already. So um, does your system for automatically locking work with uh, classes that have virtual uh, virtual basis? So the next case they're going to have an extra pointer to a table of offsets of the virtual base inside the whole object. So the question is, does this work with virtual basis? Uh, I'm not entirely sure because I don't actually find those in use much at all. As in, I think I've, I've seen them used three times in the past 10 years. Um, in case of multiple inheritance, that does work because you basically have just multiple V tables inside the object and you can mark any function in any V table. In case of the virtual inheritance, you would need to have a, an object pointer in there and I'm not currently doing that in part because there's no way to know. So I would, I would expect that not to work. Jackie? Well, I, just thinking about the theorems and destructors thing, it, it feels wrong because of stuck in learning problems. And I, I feel, I think probably the way to go is you ha have more, yeah, ha have a callback reporting system where you put a, a callback in the destructor and then you check um, after a test case. But it, like you'd have to check after any, anything within the scope though, so it's, mm -hmm. it gets messy. Anyway. Uh, the, the, this talk has like a lot of overlap with my talk actually, like just anything related to reflection or, or uh, ray effects, I'm glad I came to this, but mm -hmm. I'm going to take that all out of my talk now. Um, <laughs> and, um, so have you looked at D, uh, like, or did I ever talk to you about this, hygienic macros? Yeah, uh, so in D, um, if I go back to the slide where I'm trying to instantiate things, which is over here, there's this reify function, which basically tries to take a function, uh, a reflected function object, and then ties a lambda to the implementation. And D has a way to do that, which is essentially based on strings, if I understand, uh, understand correctly, which means that you could take the part that's inside a lambda here, and then attach in front of it just a function header that says this is function name and so on, and have that be instantiated. So that would be a workable way, except that you would basically be stringly typing everything and then telling the compiler, please reinterpret this as something that needs to be compiled at this point. So the advantage of this is that it looks like code, which means that all your syntax highlighting will work, all your uh, editing will work, and it doesn't feel as nasty as a macro would be, which is also string editing, essentially. But this might be a more limited way of doing things because you're essentially only able to reify a function. You could extend it to a member, well, but it's still of, sort of limited. Yeah, uh, there, there's, a couple, there's a couple problems. I mean, and I, I'm gonna talk about this in my talk, so feel free to, I don't wanna co-opt questions for your talk, uh, but the questions are like, what if I wanna change the return type of that? Okay, I could have that lambda return a different type, maybe that's fine. What if I wanted to take 
um, that meta information, but actually specify different uh, parameters. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe I could change the signature of that lambda, um, and that'd be fine. What if I have overloads with the same function? How do I represent overloads with the same name? And like, it, you know, it, it, there, there's so many corner cases of functions in the language that it could be a problem. Um, what do I do about things that are like invocable but not member functions? Like they have a, a defined operator paren and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So. so the idea is that there are multiple different things that you could want to reify and whether this would be capable of handling all of them. And that's a good question. And, and this is why C plus plus twenty three plus three again. Yes, that is why it would be C++23. Uh, because basically, one of the options is to reify with a, a concrete example. You could take F and modify that in place or make a copy of it at incons expert time. So that could allow you to change the name, to make overloads, to have different return types, that kind of thing. Um, so it doesn't need to be too constrained, but this is one way to do things. And the alternative is to basically just say, well, go and assemble a string of bytes and then feed that to the, to the compiler and reinterpret that as some more code. And that will basically handle all cases. So as in deep mixins, you can do anything you want in many literal ways. But it's also, it's kind of, it, it feels a bit ugly. As in you're doing string uh, assembly to make some more code. Which means you get all these string assembly uh, problems. And at the same time, it doesn't look like code. It looks like a string. And it's a string that you're runtime assembling to make it look like code. Well, they are actually assembled at compile time, the D mixins. But yeah. Yeah, but I see your point. Yeah, runtime assembly in cons expert. So, yeah, yeah compile time. Like for, okay. <laughs> but that's sort of the same thing. <coughs> Any other questions? Well, maybe an idea for the verify all and uh, Trying to solve that problem, maybe you could make the most complex with the lambda, and put all the code inside the lambda. The most complex calls it, mm -hmm. and if it's called, then uh, I, and, and then okay, it calls the lambda, then it it checks if uh, all the most all the executions have been fulfilled, mm -hmm. and you don't need to do it in the destructor anymore. Then you would do it in. Uh, so the question was, do you need to do it in a destructor when you could make it make the entire test case a part of a lambda being executed by a marking framework? Yeah. That would work, but that means that the marking framework is very intrusive into whatever test environment you have. That's uh, one of the problems that Google Mark has, which is basically if you're using Google Mark, then you shall be using Google Test because it's intricately tied. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it will work with anything. You can use it without a test framework. You can use it in in catch. You can use it in anything. Um. What I have in mind, uh, it will work with anything. If you go back to your example, then we take a more complex, maybe. Uh, Let's see. That is over the over here. So is it the structure of uh, mocks which calls verify all? Yeah, mocks verify all. So in case of the example, I opted to make it explicit. Mm -hmm. as in to, to make the question uh, uh, end up at the end of the presentation. Um, in this case, you could also omit that, and it would do the exact same behavior. Well, it puts everything which is between mocks, the, 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 the declaration of mocks, and the code to verify on, make all that a lambda. Yes, so you can do that, but mm -hmm. that means that your entire test body will be uh, something that is wrapped inside the mock repository. Mm -hmm. Which means that if you have mocks set up in a different uh, bit of code, you would have to make that all part of the lemma. Yeah, sure. And in many cases, that means your test has to be structured in such a way as to make that possible. Mm. Which is, it's a bit more intrusive. Yeah. So I wouldn't do that because of that reason, but it's an option. Another option would be to just not automatically check those things and leave it up to the user. Or to only give an assert message to the user saying, well, there is a problem in this test, and I have no way to report it. Got one more. Question. Sure. Sorry for dominating the conversation. Well, um, regarding uh, how else to achieve this besides uh, awesome hacks, mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome low level hacks, uh, the uh, compiler tooling point, I actually think it's a pretty good approach. Um, <coughs> Uh, there's uh, this reflection framework uh, 
called C++, which is really tricky to yeah. pronounce in person. Uh, so like it does, it does use plain. You're not you're not actually required to compile it with plain mm -hmm. because it uses libplain to generate uh, basically like meta meta classes, like compile time meta information that you can use for plain. Uh, and it adds another build step. But yeah, that's the problem. But like plain is an open source compiler. So the comment from Jackie is that there is a library called uh, C++, C++, which starts with the letters SI, as in <laughs> yes in uh, Spanish. <laughs> and it's written by, I think, Manu Sanchez, yep. uh, which allows you to do part of the reflection using libclang. So uh, that's essentially part of the artifact of the library being now nine years old, which is that the things that were a good idea back then and that didn't exist back then have changed over time. Because if I look at libclang lip nine years ago, it was far away from doing this. C++ was maybe an, a figment of somebody's imagination at that point. Mm -hmm. And if I look at it now, I would myself think, well, maybe there are better ways to do things. I'm surprised that it's actually still a relevant mocking framework nowadays. <laughs> and in that regard, I hope that it will remain sort of relevant until we have reflection in the language, because then you can just upgrade to a new version and get all the uh, undefined behavior taken out. Any other? Uh, I was just, <coughs> just wondering, since the first time I've seen this mocking framework, do you have any like uh, website examples of different ways you can leverage the framework or resources like that? Uh, it is up on GitHub, uh, and I must say that I have been lacking in putting up uh, examples. Uh, but there are uh, a few available, and there are also a lot of libraries using it. I think if you uh, Google for it, you should be able to find at least 50 different projects using it actively uh, to mock out various parts. Okay, so thank you for attending.